Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my first gig would be Aerosmith, but screw it. I don't care. <laughs> Oops. So we're here for After Napster, assessing the threats, value, and survivability of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Anybody ever hear of <laughs> Napster? Anybody ever hear of this company we're talking about? Leah. Uh, speak a little louder. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Today we're going to talk about After Napster. Let me just introduce who we have on the panel today. So I'm going to look at something here and read some stuff. Give you a second here. Get out of here. Tell you who we are. First of all, we have on the far left Harry Reagan. Harry Reagan is a 30-year veteran of uh, technology and security sectors. His experience includes both staff and consulting positions in the financial services, healthcare, defense industries. Uh, Harry's the founder and CEO of Sunstorm Security Group, which is a physical and information security consultancy. Uh, out of the Beltway. Prior to Sunstorm, Mr. Reagan was Director of Security for Logic Tier Incorporated, a high-performance managed service company and was targeting the entertainment and event marketplace out of uh, Silicon Valley. Prior to Logic Tier, he's Director of Information Security Technology for NASD, part of NASDAQ, parent company to NASDAQ stock market. Uh, he holds provisional patents in the deployment and of biometrics for the physical access control industry. He holds a B.A. in economics from Catholic University, but we won't hold that against him either. <laughs> I was young and foolish. <laughs> and uh, an M.S. in operations research from American University. Next to him, we have uh, our filmmaker who holds a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from McMaster University. I don't know how he finally ended up in the film world, but there he am. He also is a geek. Mr. McLeod's provided technical writing and technical support for a variety of software and development firms, hardware development firms. Uh, if you'd like to speak to him afterwards and get him to talk you through rebooting your computer, no problem. He currently administers technical support uh, at a major California biotechnology firm, which we won't mention, called Genentech. And he devotes the rest of his time to filmmaking in his garage. Um, he's, um, he's, his company is called Tension Structure Films in San Francisco. That guy in the middle. Um, what we have uh, here at the end is Mr. Omar Ahmed. And uh, could you talk about yourself a little bit, real quick, while I get this? Okay, so I get this. <laughs> Check, boing, boing. Hello. Testing, 4965. Hi. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I was uh, most recently the uh, CIO and VP of Operations and Infrastructure for Napster. Uh, the fun part that I learned, at least during my job interview, was that director and officer insurance does not cover contempt of court. So. Uh, one of the things I said was, would you mind going to jail if we really fuck up? Well. I said, no, no problem. I kind of like that. The, the oddest epilogue to that afterward is, yes, I am dating a woman from Judge Patel's office. <laughs> Very good. There was a little company called Logic Tier. You want to talk about that for about six seconds? Okay, I got six seconds. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I was... Uh, CTO and founder of Logic Tier. Before that, I was the webmaster for Netscape uh, right up until the day that the AOL deal closed. Uh, before that, I was media technology director for At Home and uh, did a lot of stuff for Discovery Channel Online. Yes, I have worked with Steve Irwin. The man is going to die from a snake bite. Crikey. The, the SOB actually handed me a poisonous snake once. Here, how this? Is it, gonna, is it poisonous, Steve? Oh, it's not going to kill you. Oh, thanks, Steve. <laughs> Today, if I like you. My name is Leah Amidon. I was um, Chief of Security for Napster for a brief period of time in the days of Camelot, 
or Cam a little. Uh, I've worked in computer security for about the past 10 years. I've worked at Barclays Global Investors for Accent Technology, who was sucked up by Symantec. I've worked for BBN as a uh, security, um, chief security, um, ask her a question and she'll try to tell you the answer. I say that if you buy a $20 utility, you get a book. If you buy $6 million worth of software, you get somebody like me. So you get a person. And that's what I did for a while. Right now I am a partner and I'm the West Coast anchor for Sunstorm Security Group. We're going to talk about Napster a little bit today. Anybody heard of it? <clears throat> throw pins. Throw pins. <laughs> Technology has always been one of my failing points. PowerPoint. Love it. Okay. <laughs> I'd rather dance. It's a blue screen of life. It's a bourbon from Red. You know, they do this to me every time. All right, what happened to Napster? Let's just move on. What happened to Napster? Um, yep, that's part of it. What happened to Napster? Did the RIAA kill it? Actually, it was more of a problem internally with some of the the, the people on the board of directors, and we had a situation where we were actually doing pretty well in the courts finally. We finally educated them to the point where they had an understanding of what we were trying to talk about. And at that point, we had also Bertelsmann came into the picture. They had been there for some time, and they were trying to work with the board of directors to put in their own people. At that point, in time there were some misunderstandings, people weren't getting along very well, there were, some, um, there were some lawsuits, and that's really what happened. It wasn't really the courts that brought us down like the Superior Court of San Francisco. It was more of an internal thing. But considering how much we'd been battered against, you couldn't take much more and continue business, although we had tried. So let's talk a numbers game here really quickly. Um, 25 million people have broadband at home now, so they say 34% of the U.S. population regularly streams music today, Arbitron says. Uh, Napster enlisted more users in one year than AOL did in 15, easily. Uh, we were a little cheaper. Um, 34 <laughs> better and smarter. 34% of the U.S. population regularly streams music today. Go outside, you'll see it happening. 40% of U.S. population will be listening to the internet radio by 2003. I think that's now two. And uh, digital downloads will grow from 3% of online music sales in 2001 to 30% by 2006. It's a business. Uh, right now, we know that the RIAA makes about $46 billion a year in, in money. I don't think that each and every artists out there makes uh, quite that much. So it's a big business. Uh, at the peak of Napster's, uh, at, at Napster's peak, we had, what would you say we were going to say? We we're going to say within 95, 98 yeah. yeah. million downloads, about yeah. 600 million active users. Yeah, we weren't, we weren't keeping exact figures at the time, but that's about where we were. So in the beginning, there were games. There were things out there that people wanted to do online. The global demand for music. We had economic forces that came in. The recording industry saw that there was music there, money there, and they didn't know what to do with it. The RAA and other interested parties got involved. There was something called the DMCA that came along with copyright law to confuse issues quite a bit. So things started to get a little confusing for a while. 
building secure and successful peer-to-peer -peer systems, one of the things, if I build it, will they come? Well, if they come, will I be able to handle them? If I have one great big hunky server, my cray is overheating and I've got 90 million users online, is that going to work? If I can handle it, will I be arrested? <laughs> what do you think the answer is today? So right now, what we're saying is let the architecture do the heavy lifting. Peer-to-peer -peer does that for us. If you believe in it and build it right, let it go. And it will probably work itself out in a rather sensible manner. Um, peer to peer, it's radically different from classic architecture. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. So Napster's paradox to the three laws of thermodynamics, we believe are, you can win. If there's survivability in peer to peer networks. You can break even. Operational complexity is something you can break even on if you're working with peer to peer. And you may get out of the game, but the game goes on, and we all know the game's still going on. So the architecture of the second coming of Napster, we went through a lot of fingerprinting for the RAAA, trying to. Um, they said that was the problem. They wanted to know that we knew which tune was which. So we pulled everything offline, and we started doing fingerprinting. Somehow that was, still wasn't good enough for them. We, uh, we had our new subscriber base uh, that we put together in our demo. We were at about... 15, 20,000 at the end there. And uh, royalties, we were looking to pay. Uh, one of the things you hear all the time is that Napster steals music and that kind of thing, but they wouldn't let us pay very easily. So we were always looking to pay, mostly pay the people that did the music, not the RIAA. We were really looking to pay the people that made the music or had other royalty involvement, not necessarily the, the overseeing group, but we talked to them too. We were certainly in court with them and talked to them on the phone when they were civil to us. So do you want to know a secret? There's a whole lot here that is going to be on the CD-ROM. This is going to be a history of Napster, and this tells you a little bit about it. Because we've got short time right now, I'm going to try and go to our other speakers, but basically a lot of this will be on the CD-ROM. and. There's going to be this long history, as you see. And there's going to be Omar, who is history. Not that damn old. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and throw up my presentation, wherever that might be. Okay. Are you going to drive? I'm going to drive. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to get off the stage because I, I tend to wander around a bunch. Uh, yeah, I am in charge of the Mad Scientist Foundation. So, the, again, the big thing was that I was the one that was actually enjoined by the court orders. Uh, against Napster and the whole thing was if we fucked up I was going to jail always a lot of fun uh, So I had actually a pretty vested interest in making certain number one We complied with the laws number two that things actually worked appropriately um, What I want to talk about is sort of the genesis of what happened with intellectual property as it relates to Napster And then sort of what happened afterward and talk about some underground stuff that occurred with Napster so if we go to the next slide, so what I wanted to talk about is actually when music was young, there used to be a period of time where you couldn't actually buy a physical recording. What you would do is physically go to a music store and buy a piece of sheet music. Uh, this was obviously printed in a la old, good, good old-fashioned Gutenberg. And then roughly about the turn of the last century, this nifty invention came along called the player piano. The problem that occurred was that the music publishers were all of a sudden freaked out. Oh my God, nobody's ever going to buy sheet music again. So they made an argument saying that the piano roll, which looked like the good old-fashioned IBM punch card, was a copyright violation. And they made the same argument that piano players would be put out of work and that nobody would ever buy sheet music again. They actually took it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court did something in classic legal fashion. They looked at a piano roll and then they looked at a piece of sheet music and go, hmm, this is not a copy of this. Therefore, there is no copyright violation. Neener, neener. <laughs> good decision. The, copy, the, the Supreme Court also said we are not in the business of trying to figure out what copyright is. That's a legislative issue. The music publishers, not to be undaunted, did something else. They lobbied Congress. What happened? They amended the copyright law to include something called mechanical rights. Now what that meant was that, yes, here we've got a piece of sheet music, but anything that could mechanically reproduce sheet music 
falls under my copyright. And Congress said, yeah, we agree with that, and they set a license rate at two cents. It was a compulsory license. You had to do it. It was two cents. Where the hell did two cents come from? Well, two cents happened to be the price of a piece of sheet music. So whether or not they printed out the sheet music, they were going to get their two cents. Today, that is still known as a mechanical reproduction right. There's a, a nifty bunch of vermin in Los Angeles, not that I have an opinion about this, called the Harry Fox Agency, and they still collect pieces of money for every mechanical reproduction. Today, it's up to about seven cents. Now, you're, you're an artist. You want to go to the record company. What's going to happen? Here's the deal. Essentially, I'm the record company. I will go to you and say, guess what? I will go ahead and produce your record. We will market, distribute, and do all those other nifty things. We're not actually going to pay for it. What we're going to do instead is advance that money against your royalties. And 1996, 1997, there was a change because all of a sudden people started to look at digital rights and the question came up, gee, do we actually have these rights? This was part of a smoking gun that Napster found that said, wait a minute, how can you all of a sudden change your contracts in the middle to say, oh, now we need digital rights, we probably didn't have them. And previously the contract used to state, and this is a nifty little acronym, it stands for all together. Now, all rights, all media, worldwide, in perpetuity, <sighs> amen. So. That's what's happening to artists. They are essentially becoming work for hire. Uh, now, what happens is you are now a work for hire. The record company owns it, all rights, all media, worldwide, in perpetuity, amen. And what happens now? They put out the record for a period of time. Uh, unless you're you know, some really amazing artist, chances are the lifetime of the record is going to be in the neighborhood of 30 to 50 weeks. I'm getting a little too much feedback, so maybe I'll just wander up here. You're going to go to about 30 to 50 weeks of print time. After that, it's going to move to what's known as out of print. The record company still owns the right to put those records out, but they're out of print. What happens then? Essentially, what it's known is, now it's known as a back catalog product. You can't go to the record store and buy it. They're not going to print it, but the rights are tied up, which now leads to... The hidden part of Napster. What was actually being shared? So this was stuff that you know, was fairly underreported, but 80% of Napster traffic was back catalog material. This was stuff that you physically could not go into a record store and buy. The other thing that really happened, and I to this day still can't quite figure it out, but International was colossal. And for some reason, uh, if somebody can tell me why the Portuguese population is so huge and loves Portuguese music. I wish you would tell me. I mean, we listened to it, and it's like, well, that's good music, but I don't get it. It was just, it was colossal. Uh, the other thing was bootlegs. That was, that was a huge, huge part. You know, was there a lot of Britney Spears and boy band stuff being traded? Yeah, but the vast and powerful majority was stuff that physically you just couldn't get. The trial, uh, again, one of the biggest twists that we came up was... Uh, uh, Jonathan, who was our, our chief counsel, basically went into the court and said, you know, they're saying that we've infringed on 300 specific copyrights, but they've never come into court and actually proved that they own those copyrights. The, the recording company said, yeah, we're the record company. Of course we own them. The judge said, well, yeah, okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, why don't you prove it? At that moment, they declared an immediate 30-day cessation of all hostilities and said, hang on, let's back up and see if we can settle this. Uh, the <laughs> I thought they also said, you wouldn't do that, would you? You yeah. wouldn't ask if we really own the RAA said, you're not going to ask. You know, it's hard to figure that a guy of my ethnicity was actually working with the Department of Justice at the same time. But there was, I mean, let's face it, I mean, short of guys who look like me, guys that look like you are on the most wanted list, okay? That's... He's also a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> From Florida. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, material science engineering, if you really want to get picky. So, yeah, I can, I can replace your knees. Um, <laughs> it, it could be a hoot. But here's what they offered. was The record companies basically came down and said, tell you what, we'll give you the licenses, but here's the deal. We can't give you an indemnification. So if the artists come back and try to sue you, <laughs> we're out of it. I've got some swampland in Florida and a bridge in New York that I want to sell you. That was essentially the deal. Napster kind of countered and said, well, if you're not going to indemnify, we want a lower price. And what do you mean you're not going to indemnify? Um, when everything was said and done, uh, again, as, as Leah had alluded, we had some significant issues internal to the company. 
Uh, since I was an officer of the corporation, I'm not quite sure what I can tell you, except that there are several boards of directors that if I ever say I ran into them, it's because I swerved. Um, <laughs> Never happened. The RAAA is using a particular metric to describe what they call piracy to be. They continue to use the metric of CD sales are down. CD sales are down. CD sales are down. They blame piracy. I'm going to give you five reasons why I think they're full of crap. Uh, first of all, it's the end of the platform. CDs have lived their life. Second of all, second of all, second of all. Yeah. We've had a decline in hit, pop, uh, hit production. The fact is, uh, if you take a look at the number of quote unquote what they would call multi-platinum hits that have come out in the last five years versus five years prior, it's been going down. Look, the fact, I mean, we can say it in one, one way, the quality of the product has gone down. There is an economic downturn. I don't know if they haven't noticed, but we sure as hell have. Uh, there is sharing, and that is starting to cut. Although I would tell you that there are a number of studies that would say the issues of file sharing and what's happening to what they would call piracy is roughly about 30% of the total hit. And lastly, you've actually got some other things that are taking up your time. Everybody is not only listening to music and, and doing some other stuff. So in terms of what's happening with the, with the platform shift, one other thing I wanted to say is the top line growth, if you look at the RAAA by their numbers, their top line growth has been flat. And just to drive home the point that there is a platform shift, if you take a look at how many CD players were sold in the last year, there, there's been a 48.1% decline in the total number of systems that were sold in the last couple of years. The platform is dying. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was actually just sort of what's happened with historical downturns. When LPs went down, and you remember the, uh, you know, kind of the early 80s, we were coming out of the Carter administration, getting into the Reagan, okay, you don't remember. But... <laughs> We did have a significant drop of 7.3 to 8.3. Then, you know, remember, it's the economy, stupid. We also lost cassettes, and we lost about 6.6%. Now we're coming into another interesting economic downturn. We're also seeing the end of CDs, but guess what? The decline is roughly intact with the previous cycle. So to some extent, I got to look at the recording industry and go, boneheads, you should have been able to see this one coming. You mean if people don't have money, they don't buy records as much? It's that and there is a platform shift. I mean, we are not buying CDs. We want media in MP3s. Interesting story that I wanted to use to highlight. In 1893, there was a big thing. The Chicago World's Fair was going to happen. And it was going to be the first World's Fair that was going to be powered by the electric light bulb. You had Edison on one side and his former protege, Tesla, on the other side. Edison was backed up by this big old company called General Electric. Tesla had found this, this wacky guy named Westinghouse to back him up. And the whole thing was who was going to power the, the World's Fair. GE and Edison came in with a bit of about $2 million. Tesla and Westinghouse came in with a bit of about a million bucks. They got the bid. Now the problem was GE owned the patent on the light bulb. And they were the only ones manufacturing light bulbs. So when it came time to put the light bulbs in, they went to GE and said, hi, we want to buy you know, 4 billion light bulbs. GE kind of did this. <laughs> Might have been the other hand, I'm not certain. But they, they essentially gave them an extended middle finger. And when everything was said and done, Westinghouse had no choice, but they took GE to court. The court kind of said, well, I'm sorry, they don't have to sell light bulbs to you if they don't want to. What happened? GE went back to the lab, said, hmm, okay, what do they got here? They got a single filament design. Tell you what, let's come up with a two filament design. It's a new patent. So to this day, GE and Westinghouse light bulbs are still different. But Westinghouse went into the business of putting out electric light bulbs, and that's what they did. That same year, Mildred J. and Patty Hill Smith wrote this really cool series of songs for kindergartners. And one of them was called Happy Birthday to You. Now, it freaks me out that two people had to write this song. <laughs> yeah, I think it should be Happy Birthday, dear. Okay, got it. Yeah, six words, and you've got to provide number six. Right? <laughs> 
So that's what happened in 1893. Now let's fast forward to today. Guess what? The light bulb is in the public domain. In 1910, the patent for the light bulb ran out. Anybody could go out and manufacture light bulbs. Not one cent of royalty goes back to Thomas Edison or to Westinghouse or to anybody else who put a patent on a light bulb design. But happy birthday to you is still collecting royalties today and will be at least until 2030. Now, and I'm if there are any feds is anybody, in the audience. Has anybody got a birthday today? Anybody? Is it your birthday? I mean, anybody? here's the deal. What I'd like to say is go find people whose birthday it is today because I'm virtually certain that this facility is not covered under an ASCAP license. Sing happy birthday in a state of civil disobedience because it is illegal for you to sing happy birthday. Let's move forward. So, yeah, I just want to wind up with some of your issues. What's going to happen with IP and moving forward? In your career, you're going to move forward. Your, your work is intellectual property. Let's, let me tell you the one point that I will stand here and agree with the RAAA. Those who produce intellectual property deserve to be compensated for it. If your stuff is good, you deserve to enjoy the fruits of that labor. You are going to produce intellectual property. You're going to make copyrighted material. You're going to make stuff that's protected under patent. What are the rights that you are going to sign away to your employers, to your contractors, to your licensors? What is supposed to happen? And lastly, there's the idea of this IP green space. Now, there's a lot of different ways we can go with it. We can talk about Creative Commons. We can talk about the copyleft. We can talk about GNU licensing or anything else. But here's the real deal. Patents are good for 17 years. Copyright, uh, I think I actually changed to 95 years. Does anybody know it's 95? Yeah. Yes. Disney. I, yeah, yeah it's, it's the mouse that's going to live forever. Oh. Well, we can say thanks. We but say thanks. the issue is this. At this moment, I think we've, we've been living in a, in a point where technology and intellectual property has been living in sort of a backwater. And now, if you will, the guns of legislation are being turned to our livelihoods. The only people that are in front of the legislative body right now are fairly hostile. And it's time, at least, if we recognize that our livelihood depends on intellectual property and intellectual property rights, we need to become involved with this. So to that extent, we'll go forward. Well, you can certainly see why he is founder of Mad Scientist Foundation. Uh, Harry Reagan, who was a uh, special consultant for security to Napster. And I'm going to get your slides up. Come on forward. Actually, rather than sharing the Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, while, while Lee is getting that up, uh, one a couple of comments. Number one is our association with Napster is in the Bertelsmann version. This was the make it a business, make it legal, you know, for, uh, get everything on on the up and up. Um, one of the areas that really becomes obvious once you start getting into you know, an application like, uh, like NAMPS or the underlying peer-to-peer you know, -peer networking beneath it. <laughs> it's under the blue light special here. Here we go. Okay. Uh, if, if you go to the next one. The, uh, the whole idea behind the internet originally was to share information between willing but potentially anonymous or, or unknown users. So what uh, Napster really brought to, to the table was it, it wasn't the first file sharing application. It wasn't even the first uh, uh, music sharing application. It was really the, the first one to gain the level of acceptance it had. It had enough of a robustness and a, and a uh, readily definable content that it made sense to be adopted by a gazillion people. And the basic idea was relatively simple. You, you build uh, basic transactional semantics on top of HTTP, yet put search on stuff like that, and you build an index system to, to direct the inquiries. The only real uh, piece of unique intellectual property that Napster brought to the table was this idea of a real-time dynamic um, uh, 
directory service. Who's on? What files do they got? How do I have to? Uh, what do I have to do to to get them? And oh, by the way, if this person drops off, they disappear from the from the index. So you always knew who was who was there. That's what made it workable. That's what made it uh, as, as friendly and, and easy to use as it was. Specifically, it was targeted at music, but you, you could really use the same approach to do any kind of files. If it was a file, you could move it. Unfortunately, some of them were protected by copyright. Um, son of a gun, it worked. Um, numbers vary. With the number I like is, is 90 million users, and there's some, some flexibility in that number. Somewhere between 60 and 90 million users. More than AOL. More than AOL. Ever will be. Right. Uh, used it. <laughs> and damn few of them complained, unlike AOL. That's something else again. But you had two basic issues. One was, because of this, this directory structure, you have a single point of failure. You know, you can multiply instantiate servers. You can do all sorts of things to, to create... Uh, you know, redundancy and, and whatnot to, to support the index, but the index is a single point of failure for the, for the whole operation. You also have issue number two, is if you're controlling the index and identifying what information is where, some organizations who will remain nameless viewed that as the ability to control and perhaps even encourage the, the transmitting of of copyright infringing information. You don't have to name them, but what is their what are their initials? Uh, it begins with an R. Okay. Oh, by the way, before I go on, uh, Leah introduced me as Harry Reagan. I'm a Democrat. It's Reagan, and I get pissed about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then along came Nutella. Nutella was. Uh, had a kind of shaky start. It was actually developed by the same people who developed Winamp originally, uh, but eventually adopted a life of its own. And it was targeted at overcoming some of the issues that, that you had with this directory service. And the biggest single piece that that brings to the table is the idea of take the, direct, the, uh, the index service out of the server and distribute it to all the clients. So that when you do a search for material, Again, it gives you a real-time search, but it's ask, you know, act that, say that 10 times fast, actually asking all of the logged on clients where different material was and, and giving you the list back. Um, that gives you the, the extra little kicker that if somebody comes to you as an information service provider and says, you know, uh, I suspect this user is sharing files with that user, you can say, I can't tell. It doesn't come through me. You know, I just provide the, the, the conduit, not, the, not control the connection itself, which gave it a, a leg up legally on, on Napster. However, uh, the good news is that it gives you some degree of anonymity you know, for the users. But is it really anonymous? Is it really private? Does it really protect you know, the, who the users are? And the answer, frankly, is no. You know, by, by trade, I do computer forensics. If you look at how the typical file sharing client user installs software, they'll install it with default settings, you know, standard port settings, use the same ISP account forever. This is a forensic analyst's dream come true. Huge bodies of data on a specific port from specific addresses, it's very easy to, to identify the, the endpoints. And some organizations want to use that information. And if you know about all the subpoena activities going to ISPs, that's what this is, this is based on. No, I don't work for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, OK, next slide. OK. I have to do the legal lecture here. Our attorneys say we have to say, you know, unauthorized copying of, of copyrighted material, you know, is, uh, it can be a felony or misdemeanor depending on the value of the materials. We can get into a heated debate. In fact, attorneys are in heated debates as to what the value of a song, a work, 
you know, <laughs> who owns it. You know, that's, that varies, even in an album, it may vary song to song, it may vary uh, from, from the version of the performance of a song, and even the exact same version, but released by two different labels. So who's, you know, who, who really owns it? The uh, good old Digital Millennium Copyright Act also places the owner on the systems operator, the online systems operator, to do policing for the copyright owners. So they have to you know, make some due diligence effort to identify and, and report uh, you know, suspected illegal activities to, to the authorities. And you know, think of where they're sitting. If they're an ISP, they're sitting at the end point of, of part of the communication. So if you know one endpoint, forensically, it's fairly easy to, to backtrack to figure out who the other player or, or if that, the other player is, even if you don't know who the intermediary is, you know, a Kazaa or a Morpheus or, or somebody like that. Unfortunately, it's doable, very easily to, uh, doable and, and legal. But as Omar pointed out, <laughs> the, the, the big problem is, is humans. You know, there are uh, inconsistencies between the copyright and, and patent laws, and music in particular as an intellectual property, really requires some, some unique considerations of itself. And the world, according to me, is it's a human behavior that's the driver behind file sharing. You know, if you think of the impact of music in most people's lives, you know, you go off with your sweetheart and, you know, hey, that's our song. You know, that shows ownership there, or you went with your buddies, you know, that's my theme song on the radio. You know, th there's a sense of identity, a sense of ownership. I also believe that copyright owners are entitled to uh, being compensated for use of their works. But as long as people have access to an easy means of, of copying, reproducing, sampling, editing, playing music, you know, in any form, they're going to copy it for their for their own their, their own uses. And you do have someone, a member of your family, that's a musician. So yeah, if you an if, I, if I left him up, you'd see my son in concert. Go to www.burningshadows.com. That's his name. He's actually on tour this summer. Uh, and, and if you don't like the answer, change the question. Omar was saying uh, earlier what this impact means to to you who are, who are coming up in their careers, copyright laws have to be changed in order to reflect human behavior. Uh, there's actually precedence for this in the 18th Amendment. Yeah, the 18th Amendment uh, back about 1919 was the one that abolished the production and sale of alcoholic beverages. Yeah, that one worked. Uh, the recording industry, it, the point is, it can be changed. If something doesn't reflect human behavior, you know, it, it becomes in, you know, just inconvenient, excessively inconvenient to, to change. Uh, you know, the recording industry has to find a better way to, to derive money from, uh, from the sales. File sharing and music sharing is not going to go away. If you want to do something about it, get involved. Electronic Freedom Foundation people are actually here at the conference. Yes, I'm a member of EFF. And, um, you know, it, not just them, but, uh, you know, talk to other organizations that are working for change. We'll see some nice other symbols. Um, demographic issues, I'll, I'll let you read that on your own. The, the big message in the demo, demographics is if you look at the, the demographics of a typical file sharer, it tends to match the demographics of, of a person who is in a position politically later in their life to actually do something to, to change the, the copyright law. So get involved. It, it's worth it. Okay, next one. And uh, sorry for the editorial. I'll get back to technology. If you look at the evolution of the file sharing, the peer-to-peer the -peer type uh, technologies, uh, after Nutella, there's a, another interesting piece out called uh, Freenet. 
Freenet is basically the same file sharing, fully distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer model uh, with one extra kicker in that, and that is uh, transfer is done by trusted pairs or, or clusters of, of, of users, and that models the communications models used by uh, underground organizations and political dissidents. Accept information from parties you trust, and have a, a, a means of, of keeping them anonymous and potentially keeping them alive. It's not impossible to do forensics on it, but it's incredibly difficult. Screaming bitch comes to mind. But. Okay. And um, if you take that to the next logical step, you know, if you look at Freenet and Nutella networks the way they've traditionally been deployed, they're all terrestrial. They're all just land-based networks. Take that up a step to municipal or state or national level wireless networks, and they can be used for you know, just-in-time delivery information for you know, uh, you know, disaster relief. That's, that's big on uh, in the... Uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, scenarios, or political response. And there is an example of, of where that technology is going, the live hives and the smart mobs. Mm -hmm. Which we're going to probably talk to our filmmaker about that. Uh, we have a kind of collapsed session here right now. So we're going to give you uh, a URL to go to to get the streaming video for uh, Live Hives, the uh, Buzz of the Barricades, which is the movie that David McLeod has put together. And uh, there's a special piece that he's cut out in pre-production just for DEF CON. So um, Harry will give you the, the URL to go to to find that. Uh, probably push that up there since we can't show it today, but then the next day or two. And we'll put something up there also to let you know when it's going to be available. Uh, what David did, though, was that he was in San Francisco during the uh, demonstrations against the uh, war in um, uh, Iraq, and uh, there were rather large demonstrations. There were black bloc groups that broke away, and what they were doing was they were using smart mob and live hive technologies. One of the young ladies that he's talked to was in a paddy wagon using her PDA, wireless PDA, to... Uh, talk to people that were out there still on the barricades. One of the things you'll see in the footage that he has is that uh, there was an, a, you know, there were a group that were moving down uh, a street and there were police there. Of course, they had police on horses, they had police on uh, foot, they had police in motorcycles, they had lots of paddy wagons, they had everything you, you can imagine. But there were people trying to help pick up things that were knocked over, well, if you look at him, go ahead and, and uh, zero in on some, the, the, the trunks of a couple of police cars. They're pulling out all their right gear and putting it on. These people closer to us had no idea what was going on because they weren't part of the Live Hive group. And yet, two blocks behind us, the INS building had just been in, uh, vandalized, which uh, put us into a situation where the police felt they had to raise the level of, of response. And so you had people that didn't know and some people that did know. One of the other things they were doing was uh, uh, trying to blockade different intersections to shut the city down. And you really needed to know, you know, okay, there are plenty of people over at this corner, everybody over to that corner. And they were using wireless to do that, plus they were blogging it using, you know, they were using their phones to take pictures of the violence or what they felt they wanted to you get out there right away. And uh, some of that stuff is in David's movie. Go ahead and speak a little bit to that. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so yeah, I, I, I apologize. Can you over here if you want. Oh, sure. Okay. So yeah, I apologize. We did have post-production uh, problems with the video, so it's going to be up on the website that uh, Harry is going to give the give you the URL for at the end of the talk. But um, now, <laughs> pick one. Okay, uh, the video actually starts out with uh, 
I don't know how many of, of you are familiar with this, but every the, the final Friday of every every month in San Francisco, a, a group called the Critical Mass um, gathers all the bicyclists you know that uh, are, are willing to be politically active, and they just take over the streets for you know one big ride through downtown San Francisco. So it's significant. It's significant that the one. Um, at the in September of, of last year was the tenth anniversary of that ride, and that's significant because you know in ten years, you know the the techniques for organizing large groups of political people have gone from you know phoning everybody on your list and you know handing out pamphlets at the store and that that kind of thing, to using PDAs, using cell phones, using email, using uh, you know all these all these distributed methods of. of uh, of communication, so so the effect that that has had is that you know it makes you know the the, the basis of, of com communication, the sources of information that are being communicated, uh, that much more distributed. Anybody who wants to start up a an organization can use these these methods fairly fairly inexpensively to to, to get a group going, and uh, you know the the other effect that that has is that. Uh, Communication among everybody in your group is that just that much faster that you can get the word out that you know the example was. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, there's, oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, um, once once everybody has uh, cell phones and PDAs and emails, uh, it's that much easier to to organize people for political purposes, and it's that much easier to spread uh, information at a at a very a very high speed. Um, the other thing is it'll, it uh, reduces your dependent on traditional methods of uh, news gathering, news dissemination, um, communication. You don't need you, you don't need to have you don't you don't need to be dependent on the phone company or the newspaper or um, uh, CBS for your news anymore. So you know, there's a number of effects to that. You know that, that you've got many people with sharing the same informa same information, same interests, same political motivation, uh, who are all observing the, the the situation at the same time and reporting on it. Um, you know, you can get information on your on your political movement out that much faster. And the interesting thing that uh, that is happening is that. Uh, It's interesting to watch how this is working in countries that didn't traditionally have solid uh, telephone networks. A lot of them are now uh, adopting uh, uh, cell phone networks uh, that are much more e efficient, much more reliable than, than the traditional landline uh, methods of communication. Um, lots of countries in the third world, people just don't even bother getting telephones installed in their house. They just get a, a cell phone that they carry around all the, all the time. So for oh, okay. so yeah, you know that you know that's having a, a really great effect on on a lot of small country, countries that didn't normally have a very kind of well established democracy. People can now talk to each other. So it's also it's global and also in a group you can just tell somebody go there now and the police are over there. So that kind of thing also, and it's small, we're talking globalization, local, localization, and that distributed thing worked pretty good. Mm -hmm. And at least that's what the movie will show. So uh, that's, I believe, Harry, the correct yeah, URL. That's, that's the URL where it will be um, probably uh, uh, Sunday, Monday is, is when it will actually be there. Okay, and that's, that's basically what we wanted to come and talk to you about. Uh, does anybody want any DEF CON um, special, the last of all of the pins that were left from, and the guitar picks that were left from Napster? We have, that's all. That was what was left. They're genuine. eBay is waiting. Does anybody want any of them? Want to throw them out there, guys? You didn't sing. <laughs> Any musicians? We've got it. Okay, the time.